now on Indianapolis This Week. Well, I think we all need to take a collective pause. Reviewing the rules after student sports spiral into fights and a brawl. We sit down with the commissioner of the Indiana High School Athletic Association and discuss the call he hopes he never has to make at a sporting event. Plus, bold statement or act of treason. Our political insiders weigh in on the letter to Iran from U.S. Senators and one of the best athletes in the world. I want to win. <laughs> I want to win some more. Tamika Catchings on her future plans and present purpose. I'm really excited about this season. From RTD6, the Indie Channel, this is Indianapolis This Week with Rafael Sanchez. And thank you for joining us for Indianapolis This Week. We start this week by talking about a version of Hoosier Hoop Hysteria. We are in the middle of the boys' high school basketball tournament. It's a huge event in every part of our state, but it also comes during some turmoil for the IHSAA in the aftermath of an ugly fight at a high school game in northwestern Indiana. So what can be done? What can the group do to keep from ha this happening again? It is one of the many questions I posed to Commissioner Bobby Cox. Considering the brawls we've seen across the state, what needs to happen? What needs to change? Well, I think we all need to take a collective pause and reflect upon what is really high school sports all about. And these are games for kids. These are, they're important and people are emotional, but we need to keep it in perspective. This is educational based athletics and we need to provide an environment where there's a healthy a place to play sports where fans are encouraging student athletes to participate. Uh, officials are doing the best they can to call the contest. Coaches are doing the best they can to instruct students. And at the end of the contest, we shake hands and we move on with life. And, and I think sometimes we lose focus about what we need to do with respect to high school sports. And it gets uh, maybe too important maybe too emotional, uh, we get too involved in it. And so I think it's important for us to step back and keep it in perspective. I read a doomsday scenario in which you said it's possible if things get so out of hand that we could be seeing big games, you said in empty arenas where young people could play but no one would be in the crowd. Well, unfortunately, we've had some state associations that have gone that direction in uh, selected and isolated situations where crowd control is not attainable. Uh, youngsters have played in empty gyms with just two teams, the officials and the coaches. I would certainly hate to ever think that the state of Indiana would get to a place where we would have to clear a gymnasium to play a, a high school contest. That's the worst case scenario, but if we're going to let young people play in a safe environment and that environment is threatened, then I think we need to make that consideration if, it, if it's appropriate. Based on what you've seen though, are, are you collecting information, data to see if there needs to be changes to the rules across the board so that people get that point as a new codes of conduct? I mean, what are you hoping to see? Obviously, you just can't make a decision on a whim. But what's that discussion like? Well, we have a sportsmanship task force, and that group has met uh, periodically over the past year, and they are going to reconvene sometime in the month of May or June uh, to discuss the incidences that have occurred this year and, and what directions we need to take. And we'll take those suggestions back to our board of directors. And, and it's, it's a collection of data. Uh, you can't make a decision based on one incident. You certainly can't make it on three or four instances. You need to look at a whole climate. And, and I think what our sportsmanship task force and our board of directors will look at is what is the climate of high school sports right now? What, what's the environment like? And then what can we do once we make those assertions? What can we do to uh, make it better? You made a tough decision on the Northwest Indiana team. They appealed, they went to a court, the court overturned your decision. Does that send a mixed message to the crowd saying that if you make a decision and the school appeals that maybe that behavior wasn't that bad after all? I certainly believe it sends a, a mixed message and I think that it's unfortunate that the court system has to get involved in the uh, businesses of a private organization of a voluntary membership. These two schools are voluntary members and when they join the association, they make a pledge to uphold the rules and the decisions of that organization. So I think there's a choice. You either abide by those rules or maybe you go elsewhere and, and do your own thing. And that's the disappointing piece of this. I think it sends a bad message that when you don't get your way, you just trot off to court and you try to find another way and you keep running things up the flagpole until you get the answer you want. 
You take safety very seriously as an association, and one of the things you have focused on is head injuries with concussions and, and making people aware, coaches, parents aware. Is that working so far as you envisioned it, your concussion policy? I feel that the concussion protocol is working well. Uh, recently, within the last year, we've also added a, a data collection instrument for our membership where our athletic trainers are reporting concussive events that occur in their school. And we're collecting that data and we hope to collect it over a series of many years. And then we can compare and contrast the data to determine uh, trends that might be occurring in our uh, membership with respect to games and practices. Uh, obviously, there's much more practice time than there is game. So we think that the concussion the preponderance of those are occurring in practice. So where are they occurring? Are they occurring in the gym? Are they occurring outside on natural grass? Are they occurring on turf, asphalt? Where are these occurring? What are the trends? And then we can make some intelligent decisions and then maybe even su suggest some rule changes within our rules codes to further protect student athletes. Just some realistic perspective of what isn't appropriate, like you mentioned, a, a helmet in basketball. Several years ago, there was a trend where pole vaulters were going to wear helmets. Well, there was no company that was going to build a pole vaulting helmet. So what we had were youngsters wearing rubber strip helmets like you wear in a water slide or a biking helmet, really not made for pole vaulting. And many times when a student athlete puts that kind of protective gear on their head, they, they achieve this sense of invinci invincibility. And so what we were seeing, we weren't seeing any head injuries, but we were seeing um, other types of injuries because they were vaulting with reckless abandon and they were missing the pit. So the rules committee expanded the pit added padding around the pit and uh, in our last state track meet there wasn't one single vaulter between the girls and the boys meets that wore a, a protective headgear. So I think you have to take that data and balance it and find out what's really appropriate and in some cases there will be an opportunity to improve equipment, improve safety, change the rules. In other cases, it might be just a point of emphasis within that sport. Boys basketball championships uh, game just a couple of weeks from now. Track and field underway. We're behind a, a collage of many sports. Wrestling is going on right now. What is the state of, of high school athletics from your, from your chair? Is it well? Is it, is it thriving? Is it I think, so -so? I think it is thriving. You know, every business and every, every uh, walk of life has its challenges, and we've talked about some of those challenges. but. You need to look at the bright side, and the bright side is we have over 160,000 student athletes in this state participating in education-based athletics from 410 member schools. That doesn't even count the middle schoolers and all the elementary kids that are playing sports. I think education-based sports are in a great spot right now. Uh, we're certainly learning a lot every day and every year that we move forward, but I also think that the, um, this, the, the state of sports is good, and uh, attendance numbers are going up. Participation numbers are going up in our sports. There are more kids playing. Uh, we're trying to provide uh, unique and, and uh, opportunities and ways to get schools so they can afford these things and, and offer more opportunities for kids. So I think the state of sport is pretty good. Having said that, we have to take a pause and make sure that we're going in the right direction and continue to evaluate our processes and our procedures. Commissioner Cox, thank you so much. Raphael, thank you. Thank you for joining us on the program. We'll come back and visit with you again. Very good. Thank you, sir. The Commissioner, thank you. So now it's your turn. We want to hear from you. What change, if any, should the IHSAA make to deal with student and parent bad behavior at sporting events? Send me your thoughts right now. My Twitter handle, Raphael on TV. Next, a change in leadership for the state Republican Party. What does that mean for Mike Pence and his plans to run for re-election or the presidency? The insiders are ready to debate when we return. Welcome back to Indianapolis this week as we welcome in our political insiders to the round table. Barry Beth Schneider, longtime reporter for the Indianapolis Star at the State House. Adam Kirsch, former executive director for the Marion County Democratic Party and Republican Pete Seat, who worked in the communications office for President George W. Bush. Let's start with the big topic of the morning, of course, and that is that the state's GOP leader has left the building. Uh, you worked over at the state party doing communications. Um, 
is uh, Tim Berry leaving after less than two years. How unusual is that? And what does that tell us about Mike Pence's next plans for 2016? Anything? These jobs are fairly cyclical and they're based on election cycles. So I don't think there's a lot of shock that Tim Berry's leaving. If he were to stay much longer, that's a commitment through 2016. And some people aren't willing to do that and it's time to move on. And I remember when Eric Holcomb stepped down, he said, there's no perfect time to leave the party chairman's job, but you have to do it when the time is right. Uh, so Jeff Cardwell, former city county council, will most likely be the next chair. Uh, I think it just adds more credibility to the line of thinking that Governor Pence will run for re-election. That seems to be the common thought that he's moved on from the presidential race, but we won't know for certain for another couple of weeks. Was this Tim Berry's choice? I think he was ready to go. I've not spoken to him about it, but again, it's you assume after a big election cycle, which 2014 was, the midterm election, statewide races, congressional races, that people are going to look at what's next in their career and their lives. And Adam, by changing the seats on the deck of the, of the ship, does this mean that the governor may be saying, listen, I'm going to give up the presidential run? I'm going to stick out in 2016 in Indiana. I don't think it says anything about what Mike Pence is running for. I think he still wants to run for president, and you certainly need an ally in your state party if you're running for president. Um, clearly, Governor Pence showed Chairman Barry the door. Um, this was a this was a force. It looks like, it certainly sounds like, seems like, um, and there there's got to be some hurt feelings there. And what gives you that impression? Because you've held a county seat, so mm -hmm. do you know what it's like to be shown the door? Or do um, you know <laughs> when people... I mean, in the sense of, do you know how those dynamics work, is what I'm saying. Um, you know, it, it, Wait a minute. It happened very fast. Okay. Um, and Jeff Cardwell was talked about as the potential chicker last time around um, and wasn't picked for whatever reason. And I don't think you change state chairs unless there's dissatisfaction with the chair. Okay, another big topic this week, that letter from Republicans, senators to the leader of Iran telling him not to reach a nuclear agreement with the United States. So President Obama saying Friday that he was embarrassed for the 47 senators who signed that letter. We also asked Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly of Indiana about it this week. He says he's incredibly disappointed so many senators signed that letter. We are in the midst of attempting to get an agreement um, to make sure that Iran does not have nuclear weapons. Um, there's no guarantee that agreement um, will be signed that we'll be able to get to that point. The alternative may, down the road, wind up as war. And so this is as serious as it gets. To, um, to be in the middle of sending a letter to a foreign country, to foreign leaders, as negotiations are going on, I don't think is appropriate. We should also point out that Senator Dan Coats, the Republican, did not sign the letter. And because he didn't sign it, I think this was the first week I saw a lot of tweets from Democrats saying, good job, Senator Coats. So it, it was the right decision for Indiana? He was one of seven Republican senators to not sign the letter. I think a lot of it goes back to his experience as ambassador to Germany. Germany and as well the struggle within the Republican Senate uh, over strategies and tactics. I think Dan agrees with the strategies but this wasn't the right tactic to try and get that implemented. Adam, some, some call this an act of treason that the 47 who sent this letter to this foreign leader in Iran, right, uh, that this is an act of treason. Do we see it that way? Treason is a big word. Okay. It was certainly irresponsible. Um, Senator Vandenberg is famous for politics stop at the water's edge, and in today's Republican Party, it clearly doesn't. Seven cent Republican senators didn't, but 47 did, including the Senate Majority Leader. And do, do we see it all? You worked at, a, at the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, how does the White House then deal with when senators go rogue or when people go rogue? <laughs> how do you handle that? Because this White House now has to deal with a, a large chunk of the legislature saying, you know what, don't believe the president. Well, I'm sure there were a lot of words uttered that we can't say on air uh, once the White House found out about this letter. But the, the broader point is Congress should have a role. This is an important negotiation taking place. And again, Dan Coats agrees that Congress should play a role, but getting that message out through a letter to the Iranian government wasn't the way to do it. Not just the Iranian government, the Ayatollah. Yeah. I mean, how much worse could that be? So. Yeah, our best <laughs> friend in the world. But And they responded, of course, they called it propaganda, right. and, and it really played, I think, right into their hands. Uh, in about a month's time, we should see this legislature back here at home again in Indiana should wrap up. Are things looking good? Are we going to see kumbaya moments when we end on time? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe but kumbaya moments in the legislature don't go together in the same Senate. I wanted, I wanted to, but I they'll get done I by time. I wanted to hear Adam sing. So <laughs> <that's>, uh, <laughs>
Good luck. <laughs> well, a lot got done, though, as we, as we um, approach the end. I, I think some bills are starting to move, um, but like everything in the legislative session, you've got to pay attention to the last two weeks. Pete, you got the last word. I think that's right. We're going to have a budget and I step and all these things uh, settle up, and let's hope it ends on time. And does Glenda Ritz keep her job as the board chair, yes or no? No. No? Pete? No. I don't think so. I thought you'd jump at that. That'd be the first. I'm going to be nice to Glenda today. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Change of heart. The conversation is always going on online. Join Mary Beth, Adam, Pete, Lara, and Abdul on Twitter and stay up to date all day, every day. Coming up, she's one of the top professional athletes in Indianapolis history, and she's made her plan on calling it quits. I go one on one with Tamika Catchings in our Sunday Spotlight next on Indianapolis This Week. Welcome back to Indianapolis this week. Tamika Catchings is a gifted basketball player, generous philanthropist. The Indiana Fever player signed her last two-year contract with the team. And there are many, many things that she wants to accomplish before she retires. Tamika Catchings is our Sunday Spotlight. WNBA champion, gold medalist in basketball, 10 playoffs. What more do you want to conquer? I want to win. <laughs> I want to win some more. Um, you know, it's been a blessing. It really has. It's been a, a huge blessing to be able to, to play as long as I've played and to have the success. But, you know, I definitely don't discount you know, all the hours that have been put in, the people that have helped me get to where I'm at today, the fans that I have, you know, just and even being here in Indianapolis and just how everybody has just embraced me and my family and my foundation. And, um, I mean, I just love it. Catching, picks up the dribble, puts it up, and it goes in. Was it an age thing, though? Is it because, I mean, and I don't know, because you're young, so. Hey, I'm young. You are young. <laughs> Look at you. You're very young. But is it about, is, is the body telling you that, or is just the mind saying it's time to move on and do something different? The mind. It's time to move on and do something different. And I really want to be in the front office, you know, whether it's the GM, the president. I mean, I've talked to Larry and Donnie and our, our GM, Kelly Kroskoff, and, you know, some of the other GMs around the league as well, just trying to get a take of what does it take to be in that position and, do you think I have what it takes? But do you? Yeah, I feel like I do. You know, having the experience with my foundation and running it with my sister, and you know, it's really about putting people in, in a situation that they can succeed. But you don't want to coach. No, I don't. <laughs> Why not? You, I would think you'd want to be there. You, you are the preeminent female basketball player of your time, or at least one of them. How many, how many uh, of the top players do you see that are able to coach? It takes a lot of patience, you and I'll patience? be the first one to tell you, and my teammates will tell you this too, like, I just want stuff done, you know, and I just don't have patience for excuses and not work, people not working hard and, you know, not putting in the time. You love kids. You just got back on the trip from India, um, saw you playing with the kids in India. Um, fill in the blank. Kids need... Kids need... Guidance. Kids need, well, kids need somebody that will inspire them. And it's not necessarily what profession you're in. Of course, being a professional athlete definitely gives me an end most of the time. But, you know, they just need somebody that they can count on. They need somebody that can inspire them. And a lot of these kids that, I, that we deal with just need somebody that's there, that consistently there, you know, they've been let down so many times. So they just want somebody that I know when you come into my life that you're going to be there no matter through the good times and the bad times and you know that's just what they're looking for. I want to ask you one final question that of course being one of the people that always talks about you on the national level that is the president of the United States. <laughs> president Obama. You might have heard of it, President <laughs> Obama. Do you still want to play him one-on-one -on -one? <laughs> and if you do <laughs> considering that he has more Secret Service agents than you. Yeah. <laughs> you have none right? None. Would you let him win? Oh. Oh my god. Let somebody win. That's just hard to even think about. I don't know. Do you still want to play him? It would be fun. I think it would be like for a fun, you know, fun little cause. And sure, sure. I don't know if we would let anybody in the gym to watch. Fine, so at the end have? of the day, yeah. no matter whether I win or lose, I'm sure he would say he would win. So, and the only buddy, the only person that would know is us. <laughs> <laughs> and Michelle, and yeah, the two girls, and the right? kids, yeah. And the Secret Service agents. Yeah. But would you let him win? No. You would not? No. If you win one on one, it's game on. I don't think he would want me to let him win. Okay. If he won, it would have to be fair and square. Okay. He's a competitor. We're both competitors. Okay. 
So, so you're going to win is what you're telling me. I didn't say that. <laughs> we're both competitive. We're going to compete really hard. But like he said, he's not ready right now. You know, I've been training for a while. No excuses from no me. No excuses. All right, no excuses. But I bet he would beat me in one atmosphere. You think so? Politics. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so it's a win-win, right? Tamika Catchings, basketball superstar, but more importantly, just a super person. I thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you, Rafael. Appreciate it. Have a great season. Thank you, Tamika. In the fall, Tamika's foundation, Catch the Stars, will mark its 11th year in our city. Catchings has been very active with the Brackets for Good campaign to raise money for local charities. We have a link to that on our website, theindychannel.com. Indianapolis This Week continues right after this. Take note of this. The state will hold a hearing tomorrow on a proposed rate hike for IPL customers. The increase would boost the average monthly bill by about $6 per month. That hearing will be Monday night at 6 p.m. at Crispus Attics High School on MLK Street. You can also submit comments online through the end of the month. And next week, we sit down with former Congressman Baron Hale to discuss the legislature and whether the Democrat will be running for governor in 2016. You can tweet your questions right now for him using the hashtag Indy this week. And remember that we are always on our website, theindychannel.com and the RTV6 app. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next Sunday on Indianapolis This Week.